There, there is a third uh, gospel reading for today that uh, honors Saint Alexander of Pontifisti, and I thought it would be good to me to go ahead and uh, read that, preach on it, and, and talk to you about it for a minute. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Just prior to today's reading, we hear from the gospel the familiar parable about the rich man, a certain <clears throat> rich man and his need for bigger barns to store his great and plentiful crops. Now, you all need to know that when a certain man is the moniker that is used, it means any man, every man. And that's the most important part about this. So that what is read in this gospel today, which is, by the way, Luke 12, 32 to 40, um, and if you care to read it, please do, because it's a very important gospel. It's something that calls us, each and every one of us, to be honorable and to investigate ourselves, what we do and what we don't do. So anyway, there ensues a clear discussion about greed, anxiety, and worry pointed out by Jesus to his disciples after that particular reading. It is a lovely admonition that he says here in, the day, in today's reading, don't be, do not be afraid, little flock. The Lord tenderly urges those with him, do not be afraid. But be afraid of, do not be afraid of what? Jesus' disciples have given up everything. They've left everything behind in total commitment to Christ and to the kingdom. They walked away from their livelihood and from their families. Just about everything Jesus has asked them, they have done sacrificially. The Lord often speaks about the kingdom of heaven and encourages them not to lay up treasures for themselves on earth. But to live each day in preparation for the coming of God's kingdom. They are alerted to gird up their loins, as in readying to fight in battle. And to have lamps in readiness for dealing for doing God's will. Surely, however, they had to be concerned with their daily survival, as we all are. Oh yes, Jesus certainly fed the multitudes. But you know, they were hungry later on in that day. And we are all human, as they were, so we all get hungry at times. But to think about things like next meal where we can find shelter, and how we will get by, are clearly things that affect all of us. Clearly, Jesus is aware of these concerns, and he responds to them. Do not be afraid. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's all well and good, but all, will the kingdom supply their next meal? Will there be peace and security in the kingdom? Where were we to be honest in ourselves? What would we say is our greatest fear? I would presume that most of us will answer something about the future. Perhaps we are struggling with the mortgage that we have. You see, some of us took advantage of low prices and easy financing to purchase our homes back then. However, finances have tightened up, and there have been a plethora of foreclosures recently. You see, we wanted to be like the Jeffersons and move on up. But now interest rates and taxes make it tough to continue in the current swirling situation. Some of us might also be concerned with our health. We see our parents dealing with the de debilitating effects of aging. And we see shadows of our own futures. That can be a most unsettling thought. We certainly don't want to leave a similar legacy for our children. Some might be worried whether or not we'll have enough financial resources once we retire. Moreover, some are already retired, and they are stressed about continuing in the lifestyle to which they have become accustomed. So, the bottom line, how do we respond to Jesus when it comes down to the way we live? 
we truly want to be people of faith. But we are surely aware of where our hearts really are. We know that we are constantly infected by a heavy dose of anxiety, or can we say fear? Maybe aging sloth or greed or many other temptations worry us. What are we to do? Has there ever been any thought for us about following Jesus for his sake, not for our own? It is becoming more and more evident that the cloudier our vision of the <coughs> kingdom of God becomes, and the more it can confuse our idea of heaven is, the more we try to draw something <clears throat> out of our faith, and the less we actually do by giving to it. And the less we give to our faith, the more entrenched we become to this world, and the more attached we are to here and now, the more lackadaisical and blasé we find ourselves about our faith and our entrance into the kingdom of God. You know, it's really tough to be honest with ourselves. One of the most wonderful things that God has given us is the ability to justify what we do, what we say, how we do it, how we treat other people, and how we feel about ourselves. I'm sure that if any one of us engaged in a discussion with somebody about specifics in our lives. We wouldn't necessarily lie, but we sure would embellish the truth. And when we do that, we make it far more dif difficult to admit that we have problems in our lives and we need God's help and, and the faith that he has given us to get through the things in our lives. We face now the birth of our Lord at the Nativity. What are we worried about? What do we concern ourselves with? Ladies, I'm not gonna pick on you. I know that you are worried about what you're gonna fix for dinner. I know how we feel about what we eat. How many people are we going to invite to Christmas dinner? How many people are we going to have for presents? Are they all gonna stay and open gifts? Well, the house is gonna be a mess. And of course, we men sit there and say, how am I going to help my entire family get through this season? Do we have a tree? Do we have somebody to decorate the tree? Do we have to travel too far to enjoy the family's presence? All the things that trouble us about the season of Christmas. We really should be worried about the season of the nativity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That becomes almost literally secondary. And I would dare say to some of us it becomes tertiary. We have a lot of stuff to deal with in our lives. So it's just like the certain man having to tear down his bonds and build bigger ones. Because he's got, we have more things to worry about, more things to be concerned with. Our anxiety builds every day. My only comment about the political situation in today's world is it's a mess. And we worry about that too. Some of us do anyway. What are we going to do? Is a good question that we need to ask each and every one of ourselves almost constantly. What am I going to do? How am I going to calm myself down? What do I have to really think about? And what am I going to be thankful for? Well, you know, is this person in our lives that sometimes we can remember, <clears throat> many times we just gloss over, and sometimes we even actually ignore it. I remember vividly, and, and this is by no means patting <clears throat> myself on the back, but I'm, I know that many of us have discussed what we do in restaurants. Do we bless ourselves and say grace, Father, at a restaurant? 
Now, Patty, <coughs> of course we do. Let me go into an example that I did. I not only I, but everybody that was there. We did this in a restaurant of um, the Red Lobster, and we were in uh, a town where his Beatitude Metropolitan Theodosius, a couple of, of uh, priests, and a multitude of, of parishioners from several different churches were there for uh, a luncheon that we went to for um, an assembly. And we all filed into the Red Lobster. I believe there were at least 23 of us, maybe 24. And of course, his beatitude was sitting at the head of the table, and they stuck me at the foot. I don't know why, but they did. And everybody else was trying to figure out, what are we going to do? Is his beatitude going to say grace for all of us? And somebody had made a suggestion that we sing the Lord's Prayer and ask for the, his beatitude to make a blessing. So here we are, 24 of us, standing up in the middle of the Red Lobster. And Mother Terry decided that she was going to do the tone of the, of the service, so we did. And all of us sang. Oh my goodness, it was glorious. And of course, everybody in the place was like, What are they doing, Harry? I don't understand. <laughs> And, and we, we drew everybody's attention to this luncheon. I mean, they, just, they actually applauded when we finished and sat down to lunch. I thought his beatitude was going to actually be embarrassed, but no, it didn't turn out that way. But the point was made, should we say grace at lunch in a restaurant? Oh, you better believe we should. Do we bless ourselves? Of course we do. Because we call attention, not to ourselves because of ourselves, but we call attention to ourselves on the sense of Christ and his ability to be with us. We really do, folks, we forget that. Or at least we don't pay much more attention to it than, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to say a prayer because... We're going to bless the, the food of the lady after lunch. Okay. But the bottom line to this whole thing is, just like the certain rich man that tore down his bonds to build up bigger ones so he could store more crops because he had a wonderful harvest that year. Why do we have to do that? Why not share the crops? Why not share the gift of God? Why not share the joy of being Orthodox in a non-Orthodox setting? It behooves each and every one of us to glory in the fact that we're Orthodox. We have several people on the docket that are going to be received into the catechumenate pretty soon. That's absolutely a wonderful thing. I know Mother Jerry and I will remember vividly We've gone into many churches when I was at seminary or even before. And I was in Castle. And people would turn around in different churches and look at us and say, What are you doing here? You're not Russian. Why are, why are you here? You're not Greek. And of course, it was much more evident when we went to an Antiochian church and they looked at us and said, you sure are not Daniel. Okay, what are you? But why do we have to answer that? Why do we have to justify who we are, what we are, and who is giving us the notion of being an Orthodox Christian? See, we, we don't pay attention to that, folks. We truly, truly don't pay attention. It becomes an afterthought what I used to call a come along. And that's, that's not fair to Christ, and certainly it's not fair to all of us. Why are we in this building right now? Oh, I know, it's raining outside, so we want to stay dry. But really, why are we in this building right now? I hope.
hope we're in here to partake of the body and blood of Christ and give thanks to him in prayer and song. But some of us are here because, oh, it's Sunday, honey, and we got to go to church. Really? Who told you you had to be in church? Oh, the pastor. Really? And you pay attention to what he says? Why don't you listen to what Jesus says? It's very evident that somehow or other, we have separated ourselves from the real center of our faith. Let's from now on, especially between now and the, the coming of Christ in the flesh, let's remember him. Let's thank him. Let's pray constantly that he will be with us and bless us, not with gifts, but we believe to give gifts to others so that we too can share in the joy of the nativity of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For to him is to all glory and our worship. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.